This morning, I've titled that it's kind of <clears throat> God will not be used. And you'll get the point, hopefully, in, in, in a moment. And I'm going to be reading from two texts if you have your Bibles. The first one's going to be Joshua chapter 3. And then we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4. But without a doubt, we are living in a different world. I think we would all agree that. This uh, pandemic has shaken our world as we know it. It's shaken our fellowship. It's shaken the way we do business. And this is just a drop in the bucket because uh, it's really going to shake the economy after all this. We are writing checks that we don't have. Um, and people need to get back to work, but we pray the Lord. Uh, we don't know what He's doing through this, but He's doing something. And many want things to go back to normal. And let me, let me, let me, let me give you something and hold on to your seats. I don't. Because before this corona, we had a church that was asleep at the wheel, I believe. We, we were asleep at the wheel. And God will allow pandemics, economic disasters, whatever it takes to get people who are called by His name back to an understanding that we cannot even walk without Him holding my hand. Amen? We can't do nothing without Him. And we've got to remember that. In these times, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. And a lot of people are praying for this corona to stop and, and definitely praying for those that are sick and those that have lost lives. But let me say it loud and let me say it clear. God will not be used. God will not be used. Friends, He is writing a story. It's his story, history, His story. And it's all about Him. This book, which we call the Bible, it's a Him book. It's about Him from Genesis to Revelation. It's a scarlet thread washed by the blood of the Lamb. It's all about Jesus. And we need to redirect uh, our attention toward Him. We've made a society that's all about us. We have created a society that's all about us. I've been guilty of it, guys. I, I believe all of us have. We've been blessed in this nation with a lot of things and um, a lot of comforts and a lot of things that I believe we took for granted. And when something comes along and shakes our society and we go from comfort and ease, we get all bent out of shape. A lot of us do. I, I, you know, things just... And, and, and we want to pray, God bless America. God bless my home. God bless my finances. But folks, God will not bless anything if He is not our top priority. Amen. Jesus is on His throne and we must be in the business of bringing Him glory first. Right. Then the blessings come. Then the blessings come. We need to get back to this basic principle. Jesus, you have first place in my life. And we all need to examine our hearts and really ask ourselves that question. I have to be honest. I've had to evaluate. Are you really number one in my life, Jesus? Is everything I'm doing bringing glory to you? I'm, and we need to get to a place where we're going to say, I'm going to keep my eyes on you, follow you, regardless of what the rest of society does. Now I want to read, and I'm going to read all of Joshua chapter 3. Because I think it's a blessing and I'm going to try to tie it all together. And I'll take a few moments after I read it and I'll draw a contrast to God's people today. But let's read in Joshua chapter 3. One, by the way, one of my favorite books of the Bible in the Old Testament is Joshua. Amen. They're getting ready to cross the Jordan. And I'll say it again later in the message. Jordan is a type of judgment. Okay? Matter of fact, the name Jordan means descent. It flows from the rivers where there's life and it goes down to the Dead Sea, the lowest part in the world. That'll come into play later in the message. Look in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. And Joshua arose early in the morning and they set out from Achea Grove and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. 
So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded people saying, now listen to this, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, when you shall, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. Pay attention to this part right here, because guys, this is where we're at. For you have not passed this way before. We're passing into times that we've never passed before. Mm -hmm. And the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Jesus Christ. Right. Just like they had to follow the presence of God on that mercy seat where the blood was placed. They had to, keep, they had to stay far enough to keep their eyes on the Ark because they were going into territory they hadn't been before. Guys, we're in a new world. I saw that when I went to Walmart for the first time yesterday. It is a new world we are living in, and we have got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 5, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and if I could insert something there, the coronavirus. <laughs> Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand up as a heap. Now watch this. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as those who bore the ark which is the presence of God, which is a picture of Jesus, to the Jordan, which represents judgment. And the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream, they stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Areva the salt sea, which is the dead sea, failed and were caught off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground. Not muddy ground, not a little bit of water, not ankle deep, dry ground. That's a miracle. Okay? And all of Israel, millions over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Now let me just make a couple of contrasts here, okay? I want to point out a couple of things in this passage. Notice verse 3, okay? He says, they commanded the people, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Remember, the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 4, he tells them, Stay in a place where you can see the presence of God, so where you can keep your eyes on the ark because you're going into new territory that we've never been before. And if you don't keep your eyes on the ark, if you don't keep your eyes on God, you're going to get lost. And we're tired of wandering around. We're ready to cross on over into the promised land. So let's keep our eyes on the presence of God so that He can lead you because you have not passed this way before. Folks, we are walking a way we have never, ever passed before. I'll be, I'll be 40 years old this month and I've never seen anything like 
what is happening right now at this time. And I believe, get ready, persecution is coming to the church, guys. Mm -hmm. Things will get worse before they get better. I know that you don't want to hear that, but I'm a realist and I'm a biblicist. I go off the Bible, what the Bible says. But guess what? The better is Jesus' return. Amen? Amen? And out of all of this, I believe the church can experience the greatest revival, awakening we have ever seen. We are These are pregnant times for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, guys. Look at the signs of the times. They're all around us. We need to be pointing people to Jesus. Everybody that we can. We need to keep our eyes on Him. And so as long as the children of Israel kept their eyes on the Ark of the Covenant and they let God lead them, you can continue to read on. God blessed them. You go on through the stories. God blessed them victory after victory. But over time, something happened. Over time, they got a little bit lax. They figured, we fought enough of these battles. We think we can do it on our own. I think the church has done the same thing. Guys, America was born on the blood of Jesus Christ. Pilgrims that come over here. Yeah. You go back and you read some of the original things that were chartered. It had the blood. It had the cross. It had Jesus all in it. But somewhere along the line, we built churches and buildings and we met together three times a week and we believed that we can do this thing without God. Over time, the children of Israel became lax. They figured that they could get along all right without the ark. They could go into battle without the ark. Well, let's see what happens when you leave God out of the equation. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Turn to 1 Samuel. Keep your place back. We'll, be, we'll come back to Joshua at the end. But turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Let's see what happens when they try to use God. When they just try to use God. Notice... 1 Samuel chapter 4. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So they got, they got whooped. Watch what happens. Because we do this all the time. Verse 3. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us, and some translations say, go fetch the ark. Let's go fetch the ark. He says, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So, in other words, they thought they could get along all right without God. They had done it long enough. But when they get their butts whooped, they say, let's go fetch the ark. Because let's call upon God. We're in trouble. Oh, God, save us. We need you now. But God will not be used. Watch what happens in verse 10. They go get the ark. And then they go back out to battle. But watch what happens in verse 10. So the Philistines fought. And Israel was defeated. And, but I thought they had the ark. And every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter. And there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. They lost 4,000 before the ark, 30,000 foot soldiers. What was, what was the problem? Their reaction, their response was throwing up a Hail Mary pass to God. We're in trouble, God. We need you now. And that's what many people are doing right now. I pray the coronavirus does stop. But guys, if we haven't gotten God's ear and God's attention and been putting Him first, who thinks that He's going to hear our prayer? We have to make sure that it's about Him and that we put Him number one or we will suffer judgment from God. And that's what happened. And He does it for a purpose, to bring His people back to Him because He loves us. God don't want to be second place in your life. He wants number one. I don't think it's too much to ask. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for your and my sins. We ought to be putting Him number one. Does it mean we're going to be perfect? No. But we need to be hitting our knees each and every day, 
pleading the blood of Jesus and thanking God for His grace and His mercy. And the church, we need to lead the way in being about the glory and honor of God the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We don't need to just call on Him. And that's what I see many people doing today. Uh, I know it's a, it's a national thing. They're praying twice a day for God to just end the coronavirus. But God will not be used. He just showed us that in that passage. He's not just going to be used. They called on God as a last resort. And that's what many people are doing today. God will not be used. What happened after 9-11? The towers were struck and our, our churches filled up mm -hmm. for a Sunday or two. Then everybody went back to their own doing. Mm -hmm. And I predict the same thing happened after this. I pray it doesn't. I pray this really grips people, guys, that we do experience a great awakening. But notice, 9-11 happened. What did we do? Basically the same thing the Israelites. Let's go fetch the ark. Let's call upon God. Let's have a national day of prayer. I'm all about having national days of prayer. But America a long time ago told God to get out of their country, to get out of the schools, to get out of the courthouse, take those Ten Commandments down, and we think that we're going to call upon God. I don't care how many of us say, go fetch the ark. If we don't put God back where He needs to be, which is number one, He's not going to answer our prayer. Oh, Lord. America was founded upon Christian principles. Then slowly over time, we have become lax and told to get out of everything. Get out of our homes. Adultery is okay. Homosexuality is okay. We've, we, we, we have lowered the standards. God's law remains the same. We got this, Lord, basically. We've got this. And churches, instead of being led by the Holy Spirit, we have become led by denominational spirits. And the church should be unified. I know there's some things that we disagree on uh, and there's some things that are rock solid foundation that we must agree on on the blood of Christ and accepting Him as Lord and Savior and that He rose the third day. But there's a lot of stuff, guys, that we need to work out because the church needs to be united in these days. That was one of Jesus' prayer, by the way, to the Father, that my people be one. So what must we do? I'm glad somebody asked. We must submit to the Lordship of Jesus in every area of our lives. Right. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ is the only hope for America. Yeah. But He will not be used. Not as a cuss word or a last ditch, last ditch effort to bless people who have turned from Him. Mm. I want to go back to Joshua 3 because I, I want to make this all about Jesus. What a beautiful picture of Jesus the ark is. Back in Joshua 3, I want to I show you something. The children of Israel are crossing Jordan. And as I mentioned before, Jordan speaks of judgment and death. Okay, it's a, We have pictures in the Old Testament. Jordan speaks of judgment and death. The very name means descent. Look back in Joshua 3 and verse 16. Because... And the Lord just showed me this today. Joshua 3.16 is an equivalent to the New Testament John 3.16. And I'm fixing to show it to you. Oh, this is, this, this is good right here. Not, 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 not because of me, but God, I believe the Holy Spirit. New, Joshua 3.16 is the same as John 3.16, and I'm fixing to show it to you. Notice what he says in Joshua 3.16. That the waters which came down from upstream stood still and they rose in a heap very far away. Watch. So the waters, Jordan represents judgment. It starts from life, it leads to death, to the Dead Sea. Once the ark, which represents Jesus Christ, stepped into the waters, which represent judgment, the waters stopped from Adam. Do you think that's a coincidence? A place called Adam, it, notice what it says, Adam, all the way down to the salt sea, which is the Dead Sea. The waters were ceased. It was dry ground. Here's a picture, watch it, of Jesus Christ 
standing in the way. He is the only way, the truth, the way to life, everlasting life. We all have an inherited sin and judgment from Adam. But Jesus Christ bore through that judgment. He bore that judgment at the cross at Calvary. And praise God, through Jesus and only Jesus, we can have everlasting life. Life. Do you see it there? Jesus Christ. It says the water stood still from Adam. We know that sin came by one man and life came by one man and His name is Jesus. God is writing a story and it is so, so beautiful. That's a picture when they crossed right there at Jordan of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. He held back those waters of judgment. But I don't know how much longer he's going to hold it back before his return. So the church better get busy. We've got loved ones that we need to bring to Christ. We need to bring to Christ. He took the sins all the way back to the Adam, uh, to the cross, to hold back the waters of judgment. Jesus is the only way of escape for America today. And I believe he's using this coronavirus and he's going to use... I, I, I'm, just, I'm not claiming to be a prophet. But the economic disaster that's going to come after this thing is going to be far worse than this virus. Just get ready. It's coming. Get ready. It's coming. Jesus is the only way of escape. We need to get our eyes off of the stock market. And we need to put our eyes on the soul market. Amen? We need to become soul winners once again. The church needs to be that lighthouse once again. Amen? We need to forget about any type of theology and we need to start knocking on doors. We need to be shaking bushes, doing whatever we can to get the message of hope to Jesus, of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. Because the best thing we have to look forward to, guys, is not the economy coming back. It's not the coronavirus, but it's the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? That is our hope. That is the hope of our calling, and that's what I hold on to. Things are going to get worse before they get better. But the church has a chance to see revival and awakening in America if we put our eyes back on Him. Remember, He said, keep your eyes on the ark. We're going somewhere we've never been before. Let's get our eyes. I think of that song, Brother Mike. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't take them off. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Him. For we have not traveled this way before. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to meet with my brothers and sisters. I thank you so much for Bob Baptist Church. I thank you for this pavilion that we were able to meet under. I thank you for this beautiful weather. Most of all, I thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us where we have failed you and we have grown lax, just like the children of Israel. We'll say, we get in a bind, we say, go fetch the ark. Call upon the name of the Lord. Let's have a national day of prayer. But Lord, America has bloody hands for the innocent murder of babies in the womb. Lord, we don't know how long you will hold back the waters of judgment. We know that you haven't appointed your children to wrath, but we do know that tribulation is coming. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is still here. I pray the prayer that Paul Pray for Timothy to stir up the Spirit of God which is in each and every one of us. Holy Spirit, I can't get the message through, but you can. Stir us up. Stir us up. Let this just be an ember, a spark to go forth from this place. Yes. Keeping our eyes affixed on the one that made the way. Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made. I personally thank you for my sin that you bore on the cross at Calvary. And I pray right now for church members that have gone astray, their sheep that have gone astray. I pray that not only the elders of the church and the pastor, but we all go out and we regather re re the sheep when we're able to meet again that this church We'll see the greatest revival and awakening that we have ever experienced. And we'll experience a move of the Holy Spirit 
unlike never before. Lord, we're going to throw out the handbook. We don't know how to do church anymore. You show us, Lord. We're going to follow you. Wherever you lead, we're going to go. I ask all these blessings in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.